pleased to welcome to the Pilot Lounge this morning, Mr. Robert L. Sumwalt III, Chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. We caught him at his home in South Carolina where he's uh, sitting out the quarantine. Mr. Chairman, good morning. Welcome. Richard, thanks. It's great to be with you. Well, uh, how are things in South Carolina? You know, it's a pretty day today, um, and uh, certainly I'd rather be in the office in Washington, but uh, all things considered, uh, I'm glad to be here here at home uh, in South Carolina with my wife, uh, sending things out. Yeah, and ha and how about the NTSB in general? What kind of uh, posture? It, it must be difficult to accomplish the NTSB mission during these times. It's a great question. Uh, from a from an administrative point of view, we're still we're still working. Uh, we will have a board meeting uh, held virtually or uh, through teleconference. We'll have a board meeting in about two weeks to deliberate uh, an accident product. Uh, as far as accident launches are concerned, there have been fifteen that we fourteen that we potentially would have gone to that we are not going to just simply because of the. Uh, the uh, public health crisis. Uh, I would imagine um, that is going to really impact the uh, ability of the investigators to do their job with so much time in between once they finally get on site, or I guess in some cases they just won't be able to get there and, and investigate on site. How do, you, how do you handle that? Do you just have to skip that phase of the investigation altogether? You know, in so many of the general aviation accidents, for example, as you know, we don't, we, the NTSB, don't actually go to the accident site if it's a non-fatal. So uh, usually local law enforcement uh, officials will have documented the wreckage, taken pictures, things like that. And then we can later go back and look at the wreckage uh, in, a, in a storage facility. So it's not ideal, but I do believe that we should be able to do our job um, uh, never the, nevertheless. The, if there is a silver lining, and there's, there's certainly not anything good about the coronavirus, but it is giving our investigators some downtime to work on that on that backlog that you and I have spoken about. So it is giving them some time to uh, to wrap up some other investigations. That, that's great. And, and since you mentioned that, we may as well go there. Uh, as, as you know, um, I, th I think uh, the NTSB is looking at trying to accelerate the investigations, the time from the crash until the probable cause report is released. Can you talk to us about some of the efforts underway there to try to reduce that timeline a bit? Yeah, and we certainly don't want to accelerate investigations uh, at the expense of quality. That's the one mandate that we have is that we're not going to sacrifice quality. Um, we certainly do realize that uh, some of the investigations have taken longer than, than we're comfortable with them taking. And so we have really, uh, I set that out as something that we really needed to look at. Uh, everyone agrees. And so we spent a, a good bit of time last year looking at our processes, a, a Kaizen process, a Kaizen event, which I think basically is the Japanese word for, for improvement or continuous improvement. We looked at all of our processes to see, are there areas where we can reduce some of this um, as in, in the in the systems in the uh, continuous improvement language, they talk about waste, and so we wanted to see if there's areas that we can um, eliminate some of that waste in our process. We rolled it out. We uh, came up with a with a new plan. We rolled it out uh, in Oshkosh. Our investigators met in Oshkosh the first week in uh, of March to uh, be trained on this. And uh, and by the way, Oshkosh is uh, lovely. In the winter time as well, uh, I went, and uh, uh, it's wonderful that we met at the EAA facilities. We had the entire museum to ourselves, but we had a training session there, and so uh, we were all ready to roll out. And then, of course, a week later, was the pan pandemic was was uh, was declared. But uh, we are excited about about being able to uh, accelerate the uh, the timeline for some of these investigations. That's exciting. Those investigations are so critical to the rest of the aviation industry. So much begins with those probable cause uh, releases that the NTSB finds, and then looking at the trends that come out of that and setting strategy for safety, whether it's the FAA recommendations you make or the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee, which I'm a part of. Um, so that, we're, we're all happy to hear that. 
the, those reports are so good and they're so important to us that uh, thank you for that update. I, I did want to <laughs> chat a little bit about uh, just yourself, Mr. Chairman. We're very fortunate to have you. You have oversight from an accident standpoint of all transportation modes, but you have a specific background in aviation. Can you share that with us a little bit? I'd love to. Thank you. Um, I say that I got into aviation by accident, and, and that's true. When I was 17, I heard on the car radio uh, that there had been a plane crash out by the local airport here in Columbia, South Carolina. And being a, an adventurous 17-year-old, uh, I thought that'd be pretty neat to go see a, a crash scene. Um, I got there about the same time that the coroner got there. And uh, I just told myself, just tuck in behind that guy and act like you know what you're doing. And sure enough, the, uh, as, the, as the law enforcement officials raised the yellow tape for the coroner to get in, uh, he ducked under, and so did I. And there I was on the scene of a fatal King Air crash. And uh, I thought a lot about that crash over the next few weeks. And uh, at, um, so that was over Christmas break. Then uh, a few weeks later, I took a friend of mine out there uh, to show him where the plane had crashed. And, and Richard, this is the part that really makes no sense at all. But after you see where a plane crashed, what do you do? Well, naturally, you drive by the airport and sign up for flying lessons. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, that's precisely how it happened. Uh, I'd always been interested in aviation like yourself. And, uh, and so it was a natural fit that uh, at the age of 17, I would start flying. And uh, anyway, I instructed all through college and uh, um, uh, ended up getting on with, uh, with Piedmont Airlines in 1981, had a wonderful career there. Of course, Piedmont became U.S. Airways, which is now, of course, American Air Airlines. But uh, I had a wonderful career, and uh, thank you for asking about that. Well, so, um, and then after your career with uh, Piedmont, um, you spent some time in industry for a little bit, uh, mostly still around the aviation uh, sphere and accident investigation. Is the, can, can you walk us through uh, a little bit of how you got to the NTSB once you left Piedmont? Yeah. Um, U.S. Air, beginning in 89, we had a spat of, uh, of accidents. We had five fatal accidents in five years. And um, somewhere along the line, I went through the NTSB's accident investigation school and so I, um, as you know, the, the NTSB uses parties to our investigations. And so U.S. Air was having these, these crashes, and I ended up being part of, a, part of the NTSB investigations, working through the Airline Pilots Association. So I was really familiar with the NTSB and, and, the, and the agency's uh, processes and procedures. I always had an interest in an in accident investigation, probably going back to December of 1973, where I uh, had been on the scene of that King Air crash. Uh, all through college, I would go to the university library and read NTSB accident reports. So, so it was something that I was always uh, th that I gravitated toward was was accident investigation. I, uh, huh. yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just, uh, just reading your background. It's interesting how that all came together. And then I think your background is interesting in that in, you were appointed uh, in 2006 by President George Bush and then reappointed by Barack Obama and then reappointed uh, by President Donald Trump. So three different presidents, President uh, Bush, President Obama, President Trump. Is that That's unusual, isn't it? You know, I would have to say that is unusual, and, and I'm just honored to be a part of the of this wonderful agency. So it is uh, it is unusual. Uh, there is something in the statute that says that no three, no more than three of the board members, as you know, we have five board members. No more than three of them can be from the same political party. So that's why that even the, uh, because I'm a Republican, when 2011 came along and my first term ended. President Obama still needed a Republican to be on the board, so I got reappointed uh, in that respect. So that's sort of how a uh, how a, a, a Republican ends up in a, in a Democratic administration. I understand. And does it typically go where uh, there there's five people on the board, and there are three people from the party of the president who's currently in office? Does it typically flow that way? It usually does. Yes. 
Okay, okay, got it. And so uh, I think it was around 2017 or thereabouts is when you were appointed chairman. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. And, and do you mind, share with us a little bit. I've always found the NTSB, uh, such, first of all, it's such a treasure in this country to have the NTSB in their objective status and and the investigations you do and the recommendations you make that have been so critical to driving down the safety rate across all of aviation over the last couple of decades. The construct of it is a little bit interesting to me. You have the five board members who have very specific responsibilities, and then you have kind of the rest of the NTSB that runs the day-to-day -day operations, the investigations. Can you just share with us a little bit about that, that working dynamic and kind of who does what? It's a great question. I think that most people, when I go out on an accident scene or when one of my colleagues uh, goes out on, on an accident, uh, it would be, uh, uh, we are the face of the investigation. And so many people would say, oh, you're leading the Amtrak investigation or you're leading the Southwest Airlines investigation. And they think that because I'm the face of the investigation, I'm the one on TV. Uh, but the, the reality is, is that board members do not lead investigations. Uh, we go uh, to be the public face of the investigation, to meet with the, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, do the media briefings. We go to meet with the public officials. We go and meet with the families. But once we leave that accident scene, we really should not have anything to do with that accident until the investigative staff is officially finished with it and then they present it to us for our deliberation. So um, I think there's really sort of a firewall between the investigative staff, of which we have very talented investigators, and the board members because ultimately the board members will will provide the oversight over the investigative product. And if we've been involved in it all throughout the process, then we have various views. So it's best to, to stay out of the investigation, uh, let staff do their job, and then we look at it with, fresh, uh, with a fresh set of eyes. I've always been so impressed with the investigators. When you think about what they do, they show up on scene and there's there's chaos and there's no order to it. They're they're just on the scene of an airplane crash and they have to be part psychologists to the family members or the survivors that may be there. They have to be media uh, experts. They have to be forensic analysts. They end up having to write reports. The skill sets that they demonstrate are across a pretty wide spectrum. They're pretty impressive people all in all. You know, thank you for mentioning that because we really do have very talented people, uh, investigators. I was, uh, uh, I, I'm making it a point to stay in touch with our staff during this uh, isolation period uh, and I've asked them to send send pictures to me of their pets and their children and things like that and they're doing that and I got uh, an email from one of our investigators the other day she's been with the board a number of years uh, she's got an A&P um, she's currently finishing law school um, you know um, a lot of our uh, investigators in the aviation side of the house many of which are pilots, many of which have built their own airplanes. Uh, and uh, so we do have a, a great staff. So thank you for, uh, for allowing me to brag about them. So if we can, uh, Robert, can we transition a little bit to just aviation safety in general and your, your uh, perspective on it, your feel on it? What you've been in this industry for a long time now, what are some of your takeaways or your observations from when you started to where you see where we are now? You know, the good thing is, you well know, Richard, the accident rate has come down over the years. And I think that that's a, a result of the effort of many uh, organizations, such as the Air Safety Institute, uh, the GAGASC, the manufacturers. It's a culmination of a lot of things coming together. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is, is that we, if we, through 
programs such as Basic Med, which I think I've heard Mark Baker say 30 or 30,000 or so, maybe more, have gotten back into flying, and that's the good news. Uh, but the bad news is if we have more people flying and we have a, have a constant rate, then that means we're going to have more accidents. So we want to make sure that we're continuing to drive that accident rate down. What, what do you think the keys have been over the course of the last, you know, we've driven in general aviation, our accident rate has dropped about 50% or so since the mid 90s, really a phenomenal uh, success story in terms of where we were to how far we've come. What do you think the, the uh, keys to that success have been? You know, that's a really good question. And I, I, I would turn that back to you because, you know, I'm so busy looking at the individual accents. I'm not sure that I'm the expert on the trend. So I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are on that. I do, I do want to make sure we, we are giving credit to those organizations that I mentioned earlier because they really have been on the forefront of looking for, for, for trends, looking for mitigation measures, and, and to help to drive that record down. But I'd, I'd be curious to know what, what your your take on that is. Yeah, it, it's funny. Somehow I thought you and I have had this conversation a few times, and somehow I thought that might uh, come back this way. And, um, you know, the uh, what we do, probably the, the most popular thing the Air Safety Institute releases are our accident case studies, which are videos yeah. based on the NTSB recommendations. So we start with where your investigators left off, and try to go back and reconstruct it and pick up that chain of events that led to the accident and put it in a way that's meaningful to pilots to digest and learn from. Last year, that material was accessed over 8 million times. And um, it's illustrative to all of us that it's not just pilots that are interested in general aviation safety. The general public is interested in general aviation safety. And so, I think the keys are we keep working as hard as we have on all aspects of that safety model, which is knowledge, training, uh, proficiency, equipment, and then and then that cultural piece that's so important of the of the culture that we build that people fly in. You know, you, I will give you a shout out that I I saw one that you did a few weeks ago on the Teterboro. Uh, Learjet accident that occurred, and that was exceptional. I shared that on LinkedIn, and uh, it was very well done. And also, um, you asked, what did I do after the airline? Uh, U.S. Air filed Chapter 11 for the second time in 2004, and that same, exact same weekend that that happened, I got a job offer to run a Fortune 500 flight department here in South Carolina. And I did that for two years. And we would oftentimes um, turn to the uh, Air Safety Institute products uh, for some of our training needs, things that we didn't have to be trained on, but like severe weather avoidance and things like that. So you do, uh, you do have great products and uh, they are very useful. Eight million uh, people watching those, that's uh, absolutely amazing. And so I do think that that is part of the reason that our safety record has gotten, has gotten better over the years gotten better but i know you agree with me it's gotten better but we would all like to see that go down to zero and if so if you could wave a magic wand as the chairman of the ntsb what's the one thing you would like to see across aviation that would both improve the accident rate but at the same time not kill the essence of this beautiful thing we have that's the envy of the world in general aviation that's the balance right is how do we how do we strike that balance but what would what would be the one thing if you could wave your wand that you would like to see us do? Yeah, I think you would agree that loss of control is a is a it can, loss of control in flight continues to be a a major problem. Nearly nearly half the fatalities are in the loss of control arena. So if we could really uh, work on that, um, then that would that would eliminate almost half of the fatalities right there. Yeah, it it is. We've made good progress across all the aspects, but still a uh, loss of control is, is the top reason that we, uh, that we have fatal GA accidents. So there's, there's more work to do there. Well, Mr. Chairman, this has been a real treat to spend some time with you. Uh, I wonder, could you share with us what, what's it like to be chairman of the NTSB? What's a day in the life, a typical day in the life, if there is such a thing as a typical day for the chairman of the uh, NTSB? Richard, I'm, I'm absolutely feel like the luckiest guy in the world. And I know that this sounds kind of corny, but it's true. 
when I come in in the morning and flip the lights on, I just stand in the doorway and, and for a moment I just catch my breath to say, I can't believe that I'm doing this. Uh, it is such an honor because the NTSB is an agency that I've revered for a number of years. Um, you know, typical day in the, in, in the life, uh, is there such a thing? Um, yes, there can be. If we're on call, like I am this week, uh, if I were in Washington, uh, you know, so basically, the five board members, we each rotate serving a week on the GO team. The GO team runs 5 o'clock Monday to 5 o'clock Monday. So each of us uh, have a week on call with the GO team, and that rotates every week. So when you're on call, you keep your suitcase um, handy. Uh, keep your cell phone handy. When, literally, when I go take a shower, I take the phone into the bathroom and put it on the, on the counter uh, because it could ring. And so, um, you know, if there's a, a major accident, then we're going to go. And I'd be glad to talk more about what it's like to go on the scene. But, but so, you know, when we're on go team, I don't want to be out of town. Unfortunately, uh, this week I, I am out of town due to the, uh, due to the, due to the isolation that we have. But, um, uh, you know, we're prepared to launch with the GO team. We don't don't want to be out of town. You know, I've been out of town when I'm on call before, and I've gotten called, and uh, it's a very uncomfortable position that you need to be in Philadelphia, and all of a sudden you realize that you're in, uh, in, uh, in Florida, which has happened to me a couple of times. Um, but during the work week, um, you know, there's meetings with staff. There's meetings with, uh, with outside groups. Uh, we're trying to get ready for a board meeting. We try to have a board meeting. We usually have about 12 to 15 board meetings a year. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's where we um, deliberate our accident products. So getting ready for a board meeting is, is a high priority for me. I remember I wrote an article about John Lauber, who was a board member back during the 80s and 90s. And when I interviewed John Lauber, he said that, that he said, I try to prepare for a board meeting like I prepare for a typewriting oral. And I can certainly relate to that, having had gone through training and have a few typewritings, that I want to know everything I possibly can about that airplane when I go for, for a typewriting oral. And the same thing with a board meeting. I want to really know that product when we go to a board meeting. I want to know what it what it contains. So, long way of answering your question. There's a lot that goes on in the life of not only a board member, but now that I've got the additional responsibility of chairman, there's a lot of things that go on that uh, dealing with uh, administering the uh, the uh, the agency. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, can you share with us what's it like when you show up on scene for an accident has happened, the investigator or uh, the, the board member in charge shows up on scene? Walk us through that, if you don't mind. What's that like? You know, it may appear to be chaos, um, but the fact of the matter is, is that our investigators have very much of a methodical way of stepping through the investigation. We may get there two hours after an invest after a crash has occurred, or we may get there the next day. Uh, but the law enforcement officials have staked down and protected the accident area, so no one is going to get in there uh, necessarily. And um, so we we want to brief, you know, get a debrief from them, uh, find out what what's going on, and then we'll go through and just walk through and just get a good picture in your mind about the general layout of things, uh, then we will break uh, break the investigation into several groups, several disciplines. There'll be a human performance group, there'll be an operations group, there'll be a maintenance group, a power plants group, uh, an, an, um, a structures group, systems group, and each of those specialists are in, in charge of looking into their particular areas. Um, every night, um, those groups come back together and they talk about what they've done that day and what the plan is for the next day and discuss problems. So it appears to be uh, organized chaos, but it's a process that really has served us well over the years. 
I, I, and everybody that's on that investigative team is not necessarily an NTSB employee. You reach out to experts from the engine manufacturers, avionics manufacturers, and so they all become a party to the investigation. Is that true? Yeah, that's exactly right, and I'm glad you brought that up. And so you're right. The NTSB designates those organizations that can provide technical expertise to the investigation to be parties to the investigation. Why do we do that? We can't know everything that there is to know about a Lycoming engine. So when they send, they, Lycoming, would send their, their experts, and they can help us with the engine teardown and anything like that. A real advantage, there's a couple of advantages of, of the party system. One is we get the technical expertise of the people that actually operated the airplane or manufactured the airplane or maintained the airplane. We get their expertise. Another thing is, is that it provides the, the opportunity for an immediate corrective action. If you're part of the process and you see that there's a defect or, or an issue with your product, you can feed that back into your organization immediately to start getting that corrected. And also, it provides some transparency to the investigation. It's not like the, the government running amok uh, with this investigation. We've got very, everybody's pretty much looking over everybody else's shoulders because at the end of the day, uh, the people that are there are interested in safety, but they want to make sure that, the, that their party uh, gets a fair shake in the investigation. It has been a remarkably successful model in terms of the investigations and some of the uh, probable causes you've been able to determine with scant information has is, is been pretty amazing through the years. But thank you for sharing that with us. I, I, I can only imagine uh, what, what that's like to have to have to piece that together. I, I did also want to ask you, uh, Robert, you have responsibility across all of the modes of transportation. and. Do you look across as you look across the different modes? Are there any things that you see both ways that aviation could take from other industries? Uh, and is there anything that aviation does particularly well that you think other industries could borrow from? Well, that's a great question. Let me start out by saying that one of the most common threads that we see woven throughout accidents, regardless of the mode, is failure to follow procedures. Maybe the procedure wasn't adequate, um, and that's why people weren't following it, but that is one thing that we see consistently. The procedure was in place for a reason, and for whatever reason, people didn't follow it. But to answer your question, generally speaking, aviation is doing a really good job with managing safety. I look at some of the other modes, and they are um, behind the times in terms of um, being able to manage safety. The railroads really do a great job. They're very technologically advanced, uh, but we've seen over the years that, that many of the railroads' approach to discipline uh, is, uh, by aviation standards, archaic. In the aviation business, we have the NASA Aviation Safety Reporting System. Some uh, operators have these uh, ASAP programs. They, they're constantly monitoring data through FOQA programs or flight data monitoring programs. Um, railroads, um, again, very technologically advanced in some areas, but when it comes to managing safety, uh, I think there's a lot that they can learn from the aviation business. Mm, uh, interesting, for, for especially your perspective, having, having such a broad view. But thank you for sharing that. But again, Richard, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And you mentioned service to the country. Um, you've certainly uh, you've certainly fulfilled that bill. I didn't go out and have people shooting at me. Uh, although some of the passengers that I had on the airline, for, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I've taken a couple of shots here and there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's okay. It, it's all fair game. Well, thank, you. thank you so much for your time, uh, Robert. It's always a joy to talk to you. I find you and your background so intriguing, and, and we're so fortunate to have you in aviation as the head of the NTSB. So thanks so much for your time. You're kind to say that, and I truly am honored. I feel like Forrest Gump, dumb, dumb, dumb kid gets lucky in life.